If you can, real quick, will you just, just go with me to the Bible, to your Bible, to your tablet, to your phone, to your book, and let's go to the book of John, the third chapter. Verse number 14. We appreciate everyone that participated in, in, in this month's theme, the limitless theme, and we wanted to deal with love this month. And so we appreciate everyone's participation, and we're thankful uh, that if you've contributed in some form or, or another. Let's look at John, the third chapter, and I'm going to start around verse number 13. And I'm going to start it off with this. No one has ever gone to heaven and returned, but the Son of Man has, that has come down from heaven. And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. So that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. Key verse, verse number 16. I'm reading from the Message Bible. This is how much God loved the world. That he gave his son, his one and only son. And this is why, so that no one need be destroyed. But by believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. This is how much God loved the world that he gave his son, his one and only son. And this is why, so that no one need be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. And real quickly today, I want to talk to you just from this thought, handcuffed. I want to talk to you about being handcuffed. If you can, please go to your uh, phone or your devices and share this message from our Epic Encounters page. We appreciate that. Appreciate you, Dave. We appreciate you, Bill. You guys beat me to it. So if you can, show, share this message from our page on to your page. Amen? Amen. So we're going to talk about being handcuffed today. And just, you know, for a few moments, I know not everyone in here is a mathematician. And maybe some can, if they'll be honest today, they'll, sell, they'll say that math is probably their hardest thing to, to conquer in school. They'll let you know, look, if I could just get around college or, or, or get around high school or junior high without ever having to do a math class, man, I would just speed right through that thing. Used to get angry going to school. Why is it I have to learn geometry and trigonometry? I'm never going to use this unless I'm a carpenter. And I don't plan on being a carpenter, ever. So, you know, so some of us, we, we struggle with math. But, but it's ironic because when it comes to numbers, numbers have a funny way of sticking to you. Have you noticed that? In my line of work and what I do, I, I'm responsible uh, for parts. I'm responsible for about $20 million worth of parts. One of my parts is about $250,000. Another one of my parts is about $750,000. What I've noticed, Tanika, about numbers is I struggle sometimes to remember Roman's birthday. I struggle sometimes, like this week, I had to ask Brakia to text me our home phone number because I didn't remember it. I struggle with the simple numbers. But these doggone 10-digit part numbers, I actually, no lie, have dreams about them sometimes. I have dreams that I forgot to email somebody in Texas about a part number. I have dreams sometimes. It's crazy. It's happened for years now. I've had dreams that I wake up and, and these part numbers flash in the middle of my mind. I'm like, what did I do with that email about this other part number? I remember these parts. I, I, 10 digits but can't remember my seven-digit phone number. I don't know what it is. We have a funny way uh, uh, when it comes to numbers of remembering numbers. Some of us, we really hate numbers when we look at our bank account, don't we? <laughs> we hate the numbers. And if I could ever get my check to actually fit the whole thing and stay in the bank account, I would love those numbers. Amen? But sometimes we really hate numbers when we, when we get to look at, at, at our statements every month. And, and now, but, but there are some numbers, though, 
Numbers are attached to things, attached to stuff, attached to people. Numbers, 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 certain numbers. Like when I say 911, what comes up? When I say 411, what comes up? When I say 5150, what do you think about with that number? When I say 187, what do you think about with that number? What, what pops up when I say 619? When I say 858? When I say 760? And for all my Temecula folks, when I say 951? Numbers, these numbers, they're attached to something. They have meaning. But, but today when I talk about numbers, we're going to talk about a very specific number. This number is probably the most infamous or famous scripture of all time. The numbers, John 3, 16. Some would call this, these three numbers, the three, the one, the six. Some refer to this as the numbers of hope. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, the numbers of hope. But before we go down hope's road today, before we start our journey dealing with hope and we get to our, our destination, I want to talk to you uh, uh, about this chapter. I want to give you a context of John, the third chapter, and I want to start at John, the first verse. And I put the scripture up so that we could all read along together. John, the third chapter, the f first verse, and going into verse number two, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus a ruler of the Jews, this same man came to Jesus by night. Let's stop right there. Now, I like this because John, you have to remember, is the storyteller. And he's telling you one night, while we were just busy doing what apostles and disciples and, 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 and Jesus and, and, and mentees do, there was a lawyer that came at night by the name of Nicodemus. And that word night right there is nix in Greece. It means morally stupid. So let me translate this verse for you again. John essentially says, there was a lawyer that came and approached Jesus at night asking a stupid question. So I couldn't believe it. He crept up in there and started asking stupid questions. You know the worst type of stupid questions that I hate are the ones that smart people try to ask to sound smart, but it really are stupid. Anybody agree with that? People that try to ask smart questions, but they make themselves look stupid in the process. Those are the type of questions, stupid questions, that I hate the most. Verse number two, Nicodemus. Teacher, some of us have been talking about you. You're, obvious, you're obviously a teacher who's come from God. Says, listen, essentially there's, there, there, there's, there's something about you and, and, and we know that you're a teacher. How do we know that you're a teacher? Because I'm a teacher. I'm a teacher of the law. You know teachers know other teachers. Letty, worshipers know other worshipers. Athletes can spot other athletes. Good singers know other good singers. Addicts, no addicts. Alcoholics, no alcoholics. Freaks, no freaks. So Nicodemus comes at Jesus and says, listen, me and my co-workers, my colleagues, we've been watching you. We've been watching all these miracles that you've been doing. We've been watching all these lessons that you've been teaching by the sea. And we perceive that thou are a good teacher. And he says, Essentially this, this is why it was a stupid question. Jesus said, you can see that I'm a good teacher. He says, you can't see anything without being reborn of water and spirit. Unless you've been baptized or been reborn by water and spirit. He said, really, you really don't know what you're looking at. He said, that was stupid question number one. The fact that you think you understand what I'm talking about. And God gave me revelation on this. That you can be educated. You can know the law, you can be a very religious person and be around the word your whole life, grow up in this thing, and still ask stupid questions when it comes to Jesus. Did you catch that? You can be educated, you can be religious, 
You can be spiritual all you want and still ask stupid questions and still do stupid things. Jesus is teaching a, he's trying to teach a valid point here. When you approach Jesus, don't try to be deep. Nicodemus' second mistake is he tried, to re, he tried to approach Almighty God robed in human flesh trying to be deep. Don't approach Jesus trying to be deep. Just approach him and be transparent. That's all you're required to do. You don't have to be deep, sophisticated, intellectual, but just be you. So he says here, he says, man, you don't understand. You don't know what you're doing. He says, this is this stupid for you to say. How is it stupid? It's stupid for you to say that you know that I'm a teacher based off of miracles. Why? Because here I am operating in the spirit and you don't have the spirit and you're trying to critique whether or not I'm, what I'm doing is great in the spirit. It says, unless you actually have the spirit, there's no way you can talk to me about what I'm doing in the spirit. My, I, I, I got an issue that, that sometimes, uh, you know, I don't mind when there's criticism about the church, the community of believers, from people that are inside the church, from the community of believers. But one thing I can't stand is when people outside of the church want to critique or comment on the church. Why don't you be a part of the community first before you start trying to throw rocks at the community? Amen? So he says, essentially, without vision, without the Holy Spirit, and without being baptized, your vision, my friend, is about as good as Stevie Wonder's. So essentially he says, listen, don't, 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 don't be stupid. Don't come in here and talk stupid. You need to be baptized in order to see what's going on. And this is what happens next. John 3, 14, we started reading, essentially he says this, I want you all to be able to see what I'm about to do next. You need the spirit to see and understand what's about to happen. In the next scripture here in the 14th verse, Jesus starts describing what went down in Numbers, the 21st chapter. He says essentially this, the same way that Moses lifted up a brass or copper a copper figure or bronze copper snake. And when the children of Israel began to look at it, they, began, they, they, became, they became healed on the spot. He said that's the same way that Jesus, that God is going to lift up Jesus. The same way that my father is going to lift me up. In the wilderness, when the children of Israel, they had an epidemic, they believed it was a copperhead snake. That's why they made a staff or, or a spear out of uh, copper in order to recognize what's going on, a red copperhead snake. And, and people were getting bit by them left and right. And so what they did was God told Moses, gave him instructions, said, Meet, we need you to make this figure. And every time you hold it up, the Israelites, when they look at it, they're going to be healed. Essentially what Jesus is saying, he's saying, when I get lifted up, everybody who looks at me, their life is going to get healed. Their life is going to, get, is going to forever change for the better. They're going, to be a, they're going to be granted eternal life if they look at me lifted up. So this conversation, remember, started off with Nicodemus saying, we have been watching you. We perceive that you are a teacher. Essentially, Jesus is saying, I'm going to give you all something to look at. I'm going to give you something very cool to look at, something very nice to look at, and that's me being lifted up. But here in our key scripture, I want to, want to deal with it because it starts going into relationships. And when you love somebody, this is what I find out, when you love somebody, when you're in a relationship, when the relationship starts off, you can't keep your eyes off of him or her. You can't keep your eyes off of them. You always want to see where they're going and you always want to know when they're coming and, and, and you always want to know what they're, what they're wearing and, and, and you can't wait to see their new hairstyle. But I've noticed this, uh, Dave, the longer you get married, uh, it, the harder it is to look at one another. <laughs> the longer you're together because it's harder to look at one another because people start to blow up and get fat. People start to go bald, people start to sag and wrinkle, and, and it becomes hard to look at one another. But I notice that in a relationship, relationship, even after years go by, 
that person still wants to be looked at. Right. To this day, I still want to be at least one of the sexiest men that Brachia has ever looked at. <laughs> I mean, I can't be a ghost from power, but I'm just saying, can I, you know what I'm saying? I, I just want to be, can I get one and a half, one, you know? Can I be a runner-up? That's all. You know what I'm saying? But occasionally in a relationship, they like to be looked at. It's the same relation. It's the same in the relationship with our Heavenly Father. Our Heavenly Father likes us to look at Jesus. What do you mean? That's why he says in the 14th verse, I'm going to lift Jesus up so that everybody can see him. Why? Because when you're in a relationship with somebody, that person still likes you to say you look good every now and then. That person still likes to say, I like your hair every now and then. Did you do something different? Even though she cut it three weeks ago. Every now and then they, they like to be looked at because if I'm looked at or adored just a little bit, that means you're paying some attention to me. So he says, this is what I'm going to do. In order for those that love me, God, if you want to prove your love to me, then you have to look at Jesus when I lift him up. How do we look at Jesus? He died 2,000 years ago. How do we look at Jesus? John 1 and then John 14, 1 and 14. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, 14 verse. And the word became d flesh and dwelt among us. How do you look at Jesus? You look at his word. I got to tell you. If you haven't been looking at your word very much, then you ain't looked at Jesus in a long time. Ain't nothing worse than when a woman comes in and she's had three outfits on that week and you ain't recognized none of them. I bought this on sale at Lane Bryant two weeks ago. My question is, if you love God, why haven't we been looking at Jesus? And if you say that you want to look at Jesus, why haven't we been looking at his word? Because you can't find Jesus outside of his word. If you want to see him, you got to be reading your word. You have to be an active participant in the reading of the word of God. He says, if you love me, you need to look at Jesus every now and then. I'm lifting him up in front of everybody. I'm flossing him to you. I just need you to look. Brings me here. To our key scripture and I'm done John 3 16 this is how much God loved the world that he gave his son his one and only son and this is why so that no one need be destroyed but by believing in him anyone can have a whole and last in life it's, it's interesting because when you read uh, the scripture and you do your research about copper Copper in scripture is, is synonymous with being stubborn. And the reason why he used copper, the reason why he used bronze in order to make the snake out is because he called them a stubborn people. He says, because you're stubborn, I want you to use bronze, which is synonymous with being stubborn. And I want you to lift that up. It's a reminder of how stubborn y'all are. Y'all don't listen to nobody. So God does this. He says, I'm going to lift up Jesus because that's how stubborn my love is for you. He says, I'm that stubborn that I'm going to lift up Jesus so that you all can see him. And so here it is, our key scripture. He says this, and this is what changes, this is what changes everything for us. John 3, 16. The Greek word there is love or, 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 or agape or agapeo. But here's something that's interesting. The word there has actually been replaced by a Hebrew word named koshak, which literally means for love. The word Hebrew word for love literally means a binding love. A love where you bind yourself one to another. That's the Old Testament word for love. Is that you love somebody so much that you're bound to them. You love somebody so much that you won't let go of them. You're clinging to them. Almost. Almost. Come on up here, Deadlift. Almost. Like a set of handcuffs. So it puts a whole new meaning on the word love. Essentially this. God says this, or Jesus says this in the scripture. For God so loved the world 
God was so handcuffed, and this is what makes you want to cry. God is so handcuffed to the world that he's willing to give up his only son. You want to know how much I love you? Come on up here, Deadlift. Don't worry, I got the key sitting out. Come on this side. I want to be the closest to the key. Put the handcuffs on. I need your other hand. No, you put the handcuff on. This is what God says. Essentially, I love the world. I'm handcuffed to the world. I'm so handcuffed to the world that I'm willing to let Jesus go for it. My only son. The only son that I've ever made. My legacy. The only son that I've ever produced. My productivity. I love the world so much. I'm handcuffed and bound to the world so much. That I'm willing to let my only son go. Now some of us, we get scared when our kids move out of the house. Some of us get scared when our kids move across the country. But God says, I'm, love, I'm in love with humanity so much that I'm willing to let my only son die in order to save humanity. I'm handcuffed to him. And so I'm sitting here and, and I'm thinking, I'm like, this is, this is a bold saying. This is a bold saying for you to sit here and want to handcuff yourself to a people like us. You would actually give up, and this is what I had to ask this question of the text. God, you would actually give up on the perfect human. You would actually give up on the perfect person in order to stay handcuffed to somebody like me that cusses from time to time. You would really let your only son die who's perfect. Your legacy die. Your reproduction or the one that you reproduced died in order to pick up with somebody to, be, to stay handcuffed to somebody like me that doesn't want to come to church every week. You mean to tell me that you're willing to let your only son die for somebody like me that has trouble with gossiping from time to time? You mean you're willing to let your only son die? Just so that you can remain handcuffed to somebody like me that likes to hit a crack pipe every now and then. You love me that much that you're willing to let a Jesus go so that you could stay handcuffed to me. As we walk over here to release ourselves, that's powerful. That's powerful. You're willing to stay handcuffed. You're so stubborn about how much you love me that you're willing to stay handcuffed to somebody like me that slips in and out of fornication. You're willing to stay handcuffed. You actually would choose me over Jesus, somebody like me that has problems with homosexuality, somebody like me that has problems with telling the truth all the time. You would really pick me and stay handcuffed to me and let Jesus go so that you can stay handcuffed to a weak, fragile creature like you and I. So God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I'm, I'm, almost, I'm almost through. The, the reason I like the word there, handcuffs, because handcuffs, I did some research, they do a couple things. First thing that handcuffs do is, is they actually show restraint. Don't you understand? You need to be handcuffed to God. Why? Because there's a part of me that needs to be restrained. There's a part of me that if I ever get loose all the way, there's a part of me that if I ever get pushed back out there all the way, there's a part of me that if I ever get involved in it all the way, I'll never be able to settle down and use any self-control. So handcuffs, I like handcuffs because handcuffs keep you restrained. Another thing that handcuffs do Handcuffs restrict certain things. I need that in my life. Because restrictions or God's love keeps me from going places physically, keeps me from going places mentally, keeps me from going places spiritually, keeps depression away from me. Why? Because his love will pull me out. Another thing that handcuffs do. Handcuffs. You ask anybody in law enforcement, if you ask Brother Will, he'll tell you. 
A lot of times, and I'm ashamed to admit, I've been handcuffed before in my youth. In my youth, I've been handcuffed before and guns drawn on me and shot at. But, but mostly, so anyways, I've been handcuffed before, and I didn't do anything. I was just watching. I was a spectator. Anybody ever be a spectator and get handcuffed? Okay, that, <laughs> okay thank you, Bill Brown. I got testimony back, Bill Brown. Anybody's ever been at the wrong place at the wrong time? You ever been with the wrong person at the wrong place at the wrong time? Been handcuffed. Didn't do nothing. No gun on me. No drugs on me. Nothing stolen on me. Been handcuffed. This is what I found out, the third reason why handcuffs. In law enforcement, they handcuff because when cops come in sometimes, they don't know the temperament of the situation. So what handcuffs do is they keep stuff from escalating. Because I don't know how this, how this mood is going to be in this room that I'm walking in. Because I don't know about the attitudes of the two individuals that I'm sitting with or that I'm maintaining in this room right now, we just going to handcuff everybody. Because if everybody's hands are bound, nobody's going to get to tripping. I thank God that I'm handcuffed to him because he keeps certain stuff in my life from escalating. He keeps certain stuff in my life from popping off. You keep saying, if I could have, would have, should have. You keep asking questions, how come I can't do this? You keep asking questions, why can't I do what somebody else is doing? Why can't I have that person in my life? Why can't I have that thing in my life? Why can't I have this going on? You better thank God that you're handcuffed to him and he's got restrictions on you. Because if it never escalates, I'm going to be all right. Because I know that any time, if the devil could have his way, he would turn this thing around on me real fast. He would turn something so innocent in my life around and make it to destroy. Why? Because the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Handcuffs keep things from escalating. So here's the thing, and I like this. The, the police chief of the LAPD said this in 2008. He said this essentially that the main reason that you handcuff people is because you never want to take your eyes off an individual. I'm so thankful, and I, li I like this, I like this revelation, and I'm done, that the Lord handcuffed me with his love, that he doesn't want to take his eyes off of me. Think about it. The reason why you're handcuffed to God, the reason why you've been handcuffed to Jesus, can I tell you why? It's because he wants to keep a closer eye on us. I'm so thankful because if, he's, if his eyes are close by, if his eyes are constantly looking on my life, then anything that happens in my life that I don't agree with, I know that God watches it, he sees it, and he must have approved of it. And I'm coming to a close. God is so handcuffed to us that he's willing to give up his only son. His only son. Now, I'm just saying, my son ain't the perfect sacrifice. He handsome, but he still ain't more handsome than his dad. My son is flawed. He's smart, but he still ain't smart as his dad. But I love him, though, and I see a lot of me in him. And as flawed and as imperfect as he is, I still ain't willing to give him up for none of y'all for none of y'all and some of y'all got incomes and he ain't got one and it might be enticing at the end of the day if, you, if, you, if I had to make a trade you know but even with that being said I'm still not going to give up my only begotten son God put a perfect only begotten son and said I'm going to let it go for a deity. I'm going to let it go for a letty I'm going to let it go for a will my perfect son he ain't never been in any legal problems he ain't never had any addictions he ain't never been a whoremonger Jesus has always been secure in his sexuality he's never been an alcoholic he's never stole anything he's never stole anybody's man or woman he's never lied on anybody but he said I'm gonna give it up for a bunch of flawed people that have Not only do I love him that much, says I'm handcuffed 
to the world. I don't know who you are today, but, but I want to encourage you today. You need to get handcuffed today. You need to get handcuffed today. And God's been chasing you. And God has been wanting to arrest you for some time now. You're scared of the commitment. And then you look at the sacrifice. I got to be honest. I, I wouldn't have made the trade that God made. But he did. And because he did, you ought to feel honored. We ought to feel thankful today that he chose us knowing our habits, knowing our issues, our problems and concerns, and he still wants us. No, you don't feel wanted. No, you don't feel wanted by your family. Probably don't feel wanted by your ex. Probably don't feel wanted by your children. Maybe the people at your job don't even want you. But I'm telling you right now, flawed in everything, God says, I'll take you as is. God's got the handcuffs on. Hold them up, Will. He's got the handcuffs on. I got the handcuffs. He's got the handcuffs on. He's already got it on his arm. He just needs you to go ahead and slip on your wrist. So that's how, that's how my love is. He says, I'm not committed to you. I'm not committed to you. I'm not committed to you that I'm going to let Jesus die so that I can commit to you. Who wouldn't want to serve a God like this? Stand in your feet. Stand your feet. For God was so handcuffed to the world that he gave his only begotten son. Who wants to put on the cuffs right now?